John, chapter 16, verses 16 through chapter 17, verse 5, verses 16 through 22. A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and you shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me, and because I go to the Father? They said, therefore, What is this that he saith? A little while. We cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, Do ye inquire amongst yourselves of that I said, A little while, and yet ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me? Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish, for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now, therefore, have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. Burkett notes, In these words our holy Lord proceeds to comfort his disciples with a promise that however he was now to be removed from them, yet they would shortly see him again, namely after his resurrection, it being impossible that he should be held by death, but must arise and go to his father. His disciples, not understanding what he meant, but laboring under the prejudices of their national errors concerning the temporal kingdom of the Messiah, knew not what to make of those words a little while, and ye shall not see me. Our Savior therefore explains himself to his disciples, telling them that they should have a time of sad sorrow and grief of heart during the time of his suffering and absence from them. But their sadness shall soon be turned into joy when they shall see him alive again after his resurrection. This he illustrates by the solemnitude of a travailing woman who soon forgets her sorrow after she hath brought forth a child. Thus will their hearts revive upon the sight of him risen from the grave, and no man shall be able to take away their joy from them, because he shall die no more, but go to heaven, and there live forever, to make intercessions for them. Learn hence, one, from the apostles not understanding Christ's words concerning his departure, though so often inculcated upon them, a little while, and ye shall not see me, because I go to the Father. Note hence, how unreasonable it is to aggregate to man's understanding a power to comprehend spiritual mysteries, yea, to understand the plainest truths, till Christ enlightens the understanding. Let the doctrine be delivered never so plainly, and repeated never so frequently, yet will men continue ignorant without divine illumination. How often had this plain doctrine of Christ's departure to the Father been preached to the disciples by Christ's own mouth? Yet still they say, what is this he saith? We cannot tell what he saith. Learn, too, the different effects which Christ's absence should have upon the world and upon his disciples. The world will rejoice, but ye shall weep and lament. Note 1. That it is the wretched disposition of the world to rejoice in the absence and want of Christ out of the world. When I am gone, the world will rejoice. 2. That nothing is the cause of so much sorrow and sadness to sincere disciples as Christ's absence and removal from them. Such is their estimation of the worth of him, so great is their apprehension of the want of him, that there is no loss comparable to his absence and removal from them. Ye shall weep and lament at my departure, though the world will rejoice. Learn three, that the believer's sorrow for Christ's absence, though it be very great, yet it shall not be perpetual. Ye have now sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy shall no man take from you. The joy of saints may be interrupted. It shall never be totally extinguished. It's a permanent joy, of which they shall never be totally deprived, till they enter into the ocean of eternal joy. Your joy no man taketh from you. Verses 23 and 24. And in that day shall ye ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. 
Burkett notes, At the first reading of the 23rd verse, there seems to be a contradiction in the words. Christ tells them in the former part of the verse that they shall ask him nothing in that day, and yet promises that whatever they ask shall be given them in the latter part of the verse. To resolve this, know that there's a twofold asking, one by way of question, the other by way of petition. The former is asking that we may know or be informed in what we doubt. The latter is that we may receive and be supplied with what we want. Now when Christ saith, In that day ye shall ask me nothing, it's as much as if he'd said, At present you understand but little of the mysteries of religion, and therefore ye put questions about many things. But in that day, when the Comforter comes, ye shall be so clearly enlightened by him that ye shall not need to ask me any more questions. But when Christ saith, Whatever ye ask of the Father in my name, he will give it. The meaning is, In that day when I have left the world and ascended to my Father, you shall not need to address your prayers to me, but to my Father in my name. But what is it to pray in the name of Christ? Answer, it's more than to name Christ in prayer. It's easy to name Christ in prayer, but no easy thing to pray in the name of Christ. To pray in the name of Christ is, one, to look up to Christ as having purchased for us this privilege that we may pray. For it is by the blood of Christ that we draw near to God and that a throne of grace is open to us. Two, to pray in the name of Christ is to pray in the strength of Christ by the assistance of his grace and the help of his Holy Spirit. Three, to pray in the name of Christ is to pray by faith in the virtue of Christ's mediation and intercession, believing that what we ask on earth he intercedes for and obtains in heaven. To pray thus is no easy matter, and unless we do pray thus, we pray not at all. Verse 24. Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name, that is, explicitly and expressly in my name, or by me as mediator betwixt God and man, and with respect to my merits. Do this after my death, resurrection, and ascension to the right hand of God, and you shall receive such answers as will fill you with joy. For the saints of God, under the Old Testament, and the apostles themselves, under the New, had hitherto put all their petitions in the name of the Messiah, though not in the name of Jesus. But now he exhorts them to eye his mediatory office in all their addresses to God, and promises them whatsoever he had purchased of the Father by his suffering and satisfaction, they should obtain it for the sake of his prevailing intercession. Learn hence that it is a mighty encouragement to prayer that now, under the gospel, the person of the mediator is exhibited in our flesh, has satisfied divine justice in our nature, and in that nature intercedes as mediator for whatever he purchased as our surety. Hence is the encouragement, whatever ye ask of the Father in my name, he will give it you. Verse 25. These things I have spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall speak no more unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. Burkett notes, Here our Savior tells his disciples that although he had spoken many things to them in dark parables and figurative expressions, yet now the time was approaching, namely, the Comforter's coming, when he would, by the Holy Ghost, clearly enlighten their understandings in the knowledge of divine mysteries and the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and particularly in the knowledge of God as his Father and their Father in him. Hence learn one, that the clearest truths will be but parables, proverbs, and dark mysteries, even to disciples themselves, till the Holy Spirit enlightens their understandings. Two, that the clear and full manifestation of divine truth was reserved till the coming of the Comforter, who did communicate it to the apostles, and by them, to the church or body of Christians. I, by him, will show you plainly of the Father. Verses 26 and 27. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I shall not say unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. Burkett notes, At that day ye shall ask in my name, that is, after I am ascended into heaven, and have sent down the Holy Ghost upon you, ye shall put up all your prayers and requests to God in my name. 
And I say not that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you. That is, I need not tell you, though I shall certainly do it, that I will intercede with the Father for you, for he of himself is kindly disposed and affected towards you, for my sake. When Christ says, I do not say that I will pray the Father for you, the meeting is not that he will lay aside his office as intercessor for believers, but that they had not only his intercessions, but the Father's love upon which to ground their hopes of audience. Learn thence, one, that the Christian's prayers put up in Christ's name cannot fail of audience and acceptance for the sake of the mediator's intercession and the Father's love. Two, that in our prayers we ought to so eye and look up to Christ's intercession as not to overlook or forget the Father's love, but to ground our hope of audience upon both. I say not that I will pray the Father for you, though I shall assuredly do it, for the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me. Verses 28 through 30. I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world. Again I leave the world, and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now we are sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Burkett notes, Observe here, one, a proof of our Savior's Godhead. He came forth from the Father into the world. He came out of the Father in his incarnation and came into the world to accomplish the work of our redemption. Learn hence that Jesus Christ is true God, equal with the Father, for he was not only sent by him, but came forth from him. I came forth from the Father. Observe, too, that it pleased Christ, out of his love to his people, to leave the Father and come into the world, not by being separated from the deity, but by obscuring the deity with the veil of our flesh, in order to the finishing the great and glorious work of redemption for us. I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Observe 3. That Christ, having finished his suffering work here on earth, ascended into heaven and sent down the Holy Spirit to apply unto his church the redemption purchased by his blood. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Observe lastly how the apostles argue from the knowledge of Christ's omniscience to the certainty of his divinity. Now we are sure that thou knowest all things. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. The knowledge and experience of Christ's omniscience may and ought fully to confirm us in the belief of his deity, for that attribute of the deity cannot be communicated to any other person without the communication of divine nature. Verses 31 and 32. Jesus answered them, Do ye believe now? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Burkett notes, In the foregoing verse, the apostles made a full profession of their faith in Christ's divinity and in Christ's omniscience. Now we are sure that thou knowest all things, and that thou camest forth from God. In this verse, Christ intimates to them that their faith should be put upon a great trial very shortly, namely, when his sufferings came on, and that they should all forsake him and take care of themselves. Ye shall be scattered and leave me alone. Learn hence, one, that Christ was forsaken and left alone by his own disciples in the day of his greatest distress and danger. Two, that when the disciples left Christ, they were scattered every one to his own. Three, that when they all forsook Christ and left him alone, he was far from being simply alone, because God was with him. Ye shall leave me alone, yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. God was with Christ and will be with Christians in a suffering hour, in his essential presence, in his gracious and supporting presence. He that sent me, says Christ, is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please my Father. Verse 33 These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. 
Burkett notes, These words are the conclusion of our Savior's farewell sermon to his disciples, in which he declares to them, 1. The inevitable necessity of the world's trouble. In the world ye shall have tribulation. That is, while ye have to do with the men of the world, while ye have anything to do with the things of the world, nay, while you are a being in the world, you must look for trouble, both from within and from without, from friends and foes, in body, soul, name, estate. Heartbreaking troubles, soul-rending troubles, such troubles as will make the heart to break and the back to bend. And you, my disciples, must expect it as well as others. In the world ye shall have tribulation. Hence learn that the disciples of Christ in this world may, yea, must expect and look for trouble. Observe, too, the remedy provided by Christ against this malady. In me ye shall have peace. When in the world ye have tribulation, ye shall have peace, that is, serenity of mind, a quiet and calm temper of spirit within, when the world, like a tempestuous air, is full of storms without. Learn hence that though in the world Christ's own disciples must look for and expect troubles, yet he has taken effectual care that, amidst all their troubles, in him they may have peace. Christ's blood has purchased peace for them, his word has promised it to them, and his spirit seals it upon their souls. Observe 3. The cordial provided by Christ for the support of his disciples' spirits under the sinking burden of the world's tribulations and troubles. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I have taken the sting out of every cross and the venom out of every arrow. Learn hence that it is a great comfort to a Christian under all the troubles of this world to consider that Christ has overcome the world, that is, all things in the world, which may hinder his people's comfort and consolation here, and their eternal happiness and salvation hereafter. Namely, the prince of the world, the rulers of the world, the wicked men of the world, the troubles of the world, the temptations of the world, the corruptions that are in the world through lust. Now Christ, having overcome the world, all persons and things in it are at his disposal and can do nothing but by his permission. And as he has overcome the world himself, so he will enable us, through faith in him, to overcome it also. 1 John 5, 4 This is the victory over the world, even our faith. Chapter 17, verse 1. These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. Burkett notes, Our blessed Savior, having ended his consolatory and valedictory sermon, contained in the three foregoing chapters, in this chapter we have recorded his last prayer, with and for his disciples, before he left the world, which is a copy left upon earth of what he doth now intercede for us as an advocate in heaven. It is good, saith one, to compare scripture with scripture, but not to prefer scripture before scripture, all scripture being written by inspiration of God. But if any part of scripture be magnified above another, this chapter claims the preeminence. It contains the breathing out of Christ's soul for his church and children before his departure not for his disciples only, but for the succeeding church to the end of the world. In the verse before us, observe one, the order of our Savior's prayer. These words spake Jesus. That is, after he had finished his excellent sermon, he closes the exercise with a most fervent and affectionate prayer, teaching his ministers, by his example, to add solemn prayer and supplication to all their instructions and exhortations. If every creature of God is to be sanctified by prayer, much more the word of God, which works not as a natural agent, but as a moral instrument in God's hands. Now, as God sets the word on work, so it is prayer that sets God on work. Observe, too, as the order of Christ's prayer, so the gestures in which he prayed, he lifted up his eyes to heaven, as an indication of his soul being lifted up to God in heaven to signify his reverence of God, whose throne is in heaven, and to denote his confidence in God, as raised expectations of aid and help from God, and not from any creature. Learn that the gestures we use in prayer should be such as may express our reverence of God and denote our affiance and trust in him. Observe 3. 
the person prayed to, God, under the appellation of a father. It intimates a sweet relation. It is a word of endearing affection and implies great reverence towards God and great confidence and trust in him. Learn, it is very sweet and comfortable in prayer when we can come and call God Father. Observe 4. The mercy prayed for. The hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify thee. The hour is come, that is, the hour of my suffering and thy satisfaction, the hour of my victory and thy glory, the hour, the sad hour, determined in thy decree and purpose. No calamity can touch us till God's hour is come. And when the sad hour is come, the best remedy is prayer, and the only person to fly unto for succor is our Heavenly Father. Father, the hour is come, the doleful hour of my death and passion. Glorify thy Son. Glorify him at his death by manifesting him to have been the Son of God. Glorify him in his death by accepting it as the death of thy Son for the sins of the world. Glorify him after his death by a speedy resurrection from the grave, and triumphant exaltation at thy right hand. Here note how the glory of the Father and the Son are inseparably linked together. It was the Father's design to glorify the Son, and it was the Son's desire to have that glory from the Father for this end, that he might bring glory to the Father. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify thee. Verse 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Burkett notes, observe here, one, the dignity which Christ was invested with, power over all flesh, that is, authority to judge and sentence all mankind. Observe, two, how Christ came to be invested with this power. It was given him by his Father. Thou hast given him power over all flesh. Hence the Socians would infer that he was not God, because he received all from God. But the text speaks not of his divine power as God, but as his power as mediator. And the note is that all mankind is under the power and authority of Jesus Christ as mediator. He has a legislative power, or a power to give laws to all mankind, and a judiciary power, a power to execute the laws that he hath given. Observe 3. The end for which Christ was invested with this power that he might give eternal life to as many as God hath given him. Note here, one, that all believers, that is, all sincere and serious Christians, are given by God the Father unto Christ. They are given to him as his charge, to redeem, sanctify, and save, as his reward, Isaiah 53.10. Two, all that are given to Christ have life from him, a life of justification and sanctification on earth, and a life of glory in heaven. 3. The life which Christ gives to them that are given him is eternal life. 4. That this eternal life is a free gift from Christ unto his people. Though they do not work for wages, yet they shall not work for nothing. I give unto them eternal life. Verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Burkett notes, that is, this is the true way and means to obtain eternal life, namely by the true knowledge of God the Father and of Jesus Christ the Mediator, who was commissioned and sent by his Father to accomplish the work of redemption for a lost world. Here observe, Christ calls God the Father the only true God, not in opposition to the Son and Holy Ghost, who being one in essence with the Father, are truly and really God as well as the Father but in opposition to idols and false gods. There is a great difference betwixt these two propositions. The Father is the only true God, and the Father only is true God. Christ saith the former, this is life eternal, to know the only true God. The Socians say the latter, this is life eternal, to know only thee to be the true God, and that neither Jesus Christ nor the Spirit are God, but the Father only. But how comes eternal life to depend as well upon the knowledge of Jesus Christ as of God the Father, if Jesus Christ be only man and not truly and really God. For thus our Savior affirms, This is life eternal, to know thee and Jesus Christ. Whence learn, one, that the beginning, increase, and perfection of eternal life lieth in holy knowledge. Two, that no knowledge is sufficient to eternal life, 
but the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ, who is also God. For who can think that the knowledge of a mere creature should be accounted equally necessary to salvation with the knowledge of the great and mighty God? Surely if our happiness consists equally in the knowledge of God and Christ, then God and Christ are of the same nature, equal in power and glory. The comprehensive sense of the word seems to be this, that the knowledge of the only true God and of Jesus Christ the Mediator is the life of grace and the necessary way to the life of glory. Verse 4. I have glorified thee on earth. Burkett notes, Learn hence that the whole life of Christ while here on earth was a glorifying of his Father. He glorified his Father by the doctrine which he preached. He glorified his Father by the miracles which he wrought. He glorified his Father by the unspotted purity and innocency of his life and by his unparalleled sufferings at his death. Verse 4 continued. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Burkett notes, that is, I am now about to finish it. He speaks of what he was resolved to do as already done. Here note, one, that it is a work that glorifies God. Two, that every man has his work, his proper work, assigned him by God. Three, this work must be finished here upon earth. Four, that when we have done our portion of work, we may expect our portion of wages. 5. That it is a blessed thing at the hour of death to be able to say in sincerity and uprightness that we have glorified God in the world and have finished the work which he appointed us to do. Father, I have glorified thee on earth and have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Burkett notes, from the connection of this with the former verse, learn one, that whoever expects to be glorified of God in heaven must glorify him first here upon earth. Two, that after we have glorified him, we may expect to be glorified with him and by him. I have glorified thee, and now, O Father, glorify thou me. It follows with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Here note one that Christ, as God, had an essential glory with God the Father before the world was. He had this glory not in the purpose and decree of God only, as his associates would have it, for he doth not say, Glorify me with the glory which thou didst propose and prepare for me before the world was, but which I had and enjoyed with thee before the world was. By which words our Lord plainly asserts his own existence and being from eternity, and prays for a re-exaltation to that glory which he enjoyed with his Father before his incarnation. Note, too, that Christ as mediator did so far humble himself that he needed to pray for his Father to bestow upon him the glory which he wanted, namely, the glory of his ascension and exaltation. Now, O Father, glorify me with thine own self. As if Christ had said, Father, glorify me, Embrace and honor me as thy son, who have been, in the eyes of the world, handled disgracefully as a servant. It is an actual glory that Christ speaks of, not in a decree and purpose only, for that believers had as well as he, but this was a glory when no creature was in being. 